welcome each one of you on behalf of the Minara Chamber of Commerce and Global Islamic Financial Services to this exclusive presentation on Islamic FinTech in, in Africa. Today's discussion would entail a brief on GIFS, Global Islamic Financial Services, an introduction to FinTech and more specifically Islamic FinTech in Africa and the different Islamic FinTech solutions available. This would be part one of a series of presentations introducing Islamic FinTech and FinTech in Africa. We now move over to the next slide. GIFS has been involved in advising various institutions locally and globally on Islamic finance, including Ethica Institute of Islamic Finance based in the UAE. We've also advised the Sharia Review Bureau based in Bahrain. We have also advised several governments and central banks on Islamic finance. Um, next slide. These are some of the financial products that we have developed for various institutions over the past few years. Next slide. Next slide. These are some of the services that GIFS provides in terms of developing Islamic financial products and services, including Sharia mediation and arbitration, Islamic wealth management, Sharia board development, Islamic finance training, central bank regulatory assistance, uh, Sukuk and Islamic fund structuring, etc. Next slide. Our motto is embracing Islamic finance through Sharia compliance achieving new heights in expansion and growth. Next slide. So we now move over to the core of today's discussion, which is an introduction to Islamic FinTech. So what exactly is Islamic FinTech? So Islamic FinTech is the proposition of financial services backed by technology or digital platforms in new and innovative ways. The combination of fintech technologies with the underlying Islamic principles of finance and economics. So essentially, Islamic fintech is fintech that is Sharia compliant or compliant with the laws of Islamic finance and economics. There are seven key areas of fintech, uh, and we'll go through some of these, uh, you know, areas very quickly. The first is insurtech. Now, insurtech refers to technology uh, or insurance that is backed by technology. Uh, so you have various insurance companies, whether they be, uh, you know, vehicle insurance companies, life insurance companies, et cetera, that are backed by technology uh, to disrupt the insurance industry. Uh, so obviously in Islamic finance, you have Taka Tech, which refers to uh, Takaful or Islamic indemnification that is backed by technology. Uh, secondly is blockchain. So blockchain, uh, Blockchain essentially um, refers to um, specific uh, technology um, backed by smart contracts, etc. cetera. Um, so, so this is a separate subset of FinTech. Thirdly is investments and wealth management. So you get, uh, uh, you know, wealth tech. Uh, you also get microfinance, uh, charity, and payment solutions. So these are the seven broad areas of FinTech uh, or financial solutions that have that have been backed uh, by a strong technology uh, subset. Uh, so from an Islamic perspective, uh, you essentially get two types of fintech. You get donation-based fintech and investment-based fintech. So donation-based fintech refers to where there are social financial instruments like zakat, waqf, etc., that uh, that are backed by technology. Uh, and investment-based uh, fintech, where you have investments, um, you know, Sharia compliant investments um, that are backed by technology. So examples of this include uh, Wahid Invest, uh, based out of the USA, where they have developed a wealth tech platform uh, that provides 
Sharia compliant investments, including index funds, um, or, or, you know, investments, uh, Islamic ETFs, etc., uh, backed by uh, backed by an application uh, or an app. Uh, so, as you can see, um, what is the opportunity for Islamic fintech? So, it is estimated that. 26% of the world population will be Muslim by 2030. Uh, and if you look at Africa itself, currently 42% of the population on the African continent are Muslim itself. Um, so one of the big factor of Islamic FinTech is the Sharia compliance and governance of FinTech platforms. So if you wanted to set up a platform, then how would we ensure that that platform is Sharia compliant? So essentially there, there are two things. One is to ensure that the platform itself is Sharia compliant, where it doesn't charge interest. Um, you know, there is there is no level of uncertainty. There is no um, there is no possibility uh, for for potential non-Sharia compliance uh, and and anything that could lead to a dispute. So the actual the actual platform needs to be Sharia compliant firstly, and then secondly also is that the investments uh, and solutions that are being uh, market and distributed via the platform also need to be Sharia compliant. Um, next slide. We now move, move over to the next slide. So the question is, why Islamic fintech? What are the benefits of Islamic fintech? So. The first is that because of the convenience, uh, FinTech creates convenience where people can access financial services in a very convenient manner um, that provides them with, um, with ease of acquiring and purchasing financial solutions. And we had seen this uh, in COVID uh, where uh, <clears throat> people could access uh, solutions uh, online uh, through uh, fintech platforms and through the ease of convenience, uh, through through your mobile app, etc., then you are able to access these these solutions. Uh, it also provides the means to keep economies expanding while traditional methods, while traditional methods, um, and and limited applicability. So, in other words, that um, Islamic fintech provides the opportunity. Uh, to keep economies expanding at scale, whereas you can have, you know, the, the same cost base. And I always give this example of, of WhatsApp. When WhatsApp sold uh, as a technology platform, as a messaging app sold to Facebook for over a billion dollars, it only had seven staff uh, and it operated from, from a small uh, office in the US. So, and, and, and to bring this idea home, um, there was a famous management consultant that mentioned that the, the, the future company of the world will be run by a man and his dog. So while he literally didn't mean that, what he actually meant was that uh, companies, um, you know, future, uh, you know, companies of the future will essentially be run by much lower cost bases uh, as opposed to the current, uh, you know, a large cost structures that we have within financial institutions. So, uh, you know, these fintechs, essentially through platforms, you enable uh, diversification, you enable scale at a much larger level uh, uh, together with keeping the cost base at a fixed basis. So there's an improved, efficient and secure payment system. So through the usage of blockchain, uh, smart, smart contracts, et cetera, you're able to ensure that uh, there's an efficient payment system. And you can see uh, with, with, with technologies uh, like blo uh, like blockchain, cryptocurrency, etc., that you have much more efficient payment systems uh, uh, than than simple cash management. So, if you look at uh, various institutions, uh, financial institutions globally, you would have uh, you would have essentially uh, cash management uh, you know systems, and even there in the cash management system, you would have uh, a large percentage um, as opposed to the norm in terms of cash. That, that simply would not be accounted on the books. Uh, so by having an efficient payment system, uh, there's a proper corporate uh, and, and cash management system put in place. Uh, obviously, they speed with, with accuracy. So 
you know, a person sitting in a, a rural town uh, that could not uh, go to a physical bank would be able to acquire a loan, would be able to make payments, uh, would also be able to access investments uh, at, at the touch of a button. Uh, it is all obviously an innovative way to address the financial data mining issues, activity reports, etc. So through having a FinTech uh, and, and a proper uh, technology platform, uh, the data the data that is achieved through that would be able to mine to, to be mined appropriately uh, and the proper services could then be applied uh, to through the usage of that data. A simple example of this is that uh, if you have um, let's say 100,000 clients on a particular platform and you pick up uh, their, their, their data uh, and through the usage of algorithms, You'd be able to initially, you'd be able to immediately understand, um, you know, when the client could potentially go into default or the loan, uh, whether the client has more funds available. So you could, you could, you could, you, could uh, you know, offer them a loan, you could offer them investments, etc. So I have seen platforms uh, where they have totally discarded the traditional uh, method of, um, of uh, dispensing of credit by using close to 17,000 uh, data touch points to be able to uh, afford you with a, with a proper efficient credit solution. So the traditional method, for example, of applying credit would be is you go to a bank, you provide them with your salary statement, et cetera. What happens now if you're not a salaried person and you still want to acquire a loan? It becomes extremely difficult for you to, for you to then acquire a loan because you simply are not employed. You can't show a source of income, for example, but uh, through the usage of innovative uh, credit uh, credit scoring methodology uh, by providing your data, uh, credit uh, agencies or fintechs would be able to still afford you credit. And an example of this is, um, you know, these buy now pay later schemes where you can go to an online store, for example, uh, and purchase an item on credit without even providing a salary statement, and you can get uh, an immediate loan within two minutes. So it is obviously very user friendly. Uh, you don't need to go into a bank, et cetera, to, to procure fintech solutions. Uh, and there is efficient time management. Uh, and a, and a, a simple example of this is we all know in COVID that if you had to go to a, a bank, for example, uh, you would then have to wait, uh, you, know, um, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, et cetera, before you are afforded uh, the service uh, by the bank itself. But imagine being on a platform where all of your issues can be resolved uh, uh, through a fintech or through a technology platform within within minutes. Uh, so these are some of the benefits of Islamic fintech, uh, and obviously in in South Africa alone, there remains a huge opportunity for Islamic fintech uh, for various reasons. Um, and the three primary reasons include number one, the issue of service. Uh, many many uh, many people have complained about service. Uh, from an uh, from an Islamic uh, financial perspective, and obviously by having a fintech uh, that provides efficient, uh, reliable, and sustainable service, that would uh, address that issue. Secondly, is that millennials uh, these days are looking for more user friendly uh, services, uh, you know, in in a very time efficient manner. They don't have the time to go to a bank uh, to meet with a financial advisor, etc. Uh, and, and, and you know, sign a lot of paperwork before they get uh, to invest their funds. They want a simple, efficient solution uh, where they can invest um, you know, over, over an app, et cetera. And then thirdly, is that we are able to provide much more innovation in the Islamic financial system as opposed to using the current system. And an example of this is crowdfunding. If you look at crowdfunding, you have peer-to-peer -peer lending, for example. So let's say, for example, you are an SME uh, you know, based based in Johannesburg, for example, you don't have any collateral, so you wouldn't be able to get a loan from a bank. Typically, what you would do is go to friends and family to seek a loan. But through crowdfunding, you can essentially upload your project onto a crowdfunding platform uh, and get the entire community to then loan you funds on a, in a Sharia-compliant manner, and you'll be able to start your business. So these are some of the benefits uh, of Islamic FinTech. Uh, next slide.
So these are some of the fintech platforms, as you can see, quite detailed. Uh, you have crowdfunding, uh, credit and factoring. Uh, you have asset management, uh, which is social trading, robo advice, uh, payments. You have blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and you have other fintechs uh, like insurance, etc. So these are some of the uh, platforms from a fintech perspective. Uh, next slide. So what are the some of the sh general Sharia guidelines? around Islamic finance. Uh, and I wouldn't want to go through in depth um, of these guidelines, but just a broad overview. Uh, so all the transactions must conform with, with Islamic law. There is a prohibition of interest and riba. Uh, trading between parties is, is acceptable. There is a prohibition of speculation uh, or mesir or, or, or gambling. Um, then there is the avoidance of un uncertain or excessively risky transactions, uh, et cetera. Uh, as you can see on this slide uh, of Islamic fintech, this is a market map of Islamic fintech, which shows you the different uh, platforms. So uh, if you look at banking, for example, you have the Insha platform, uh, which is based in Germany, which is an offshoot of uh, the Bahrain-based Al-Baraka Bank. Um, then you have banking IT, you have path, path solutions, alternative lending, uh, you have online lending platforms, Crowdfunding, you have uh, Blossom Capital Boost. Um, on the equity side, you have companies like Yielders, et cetera, that provide you the opportunity to buy into, uh, to buy properties online. Um, on the in investment platform side, uh, you have, you have uh, different companies uh, like Robo Advisors, uh, including Wired Invest. Um, and as you can see on the cryptocurrency side, you have crypto exchanges like Rain uh, that provide um, that provide uh, Islamic crypto uh, trading facilities. Um, so these are some of the, um, you know, platforms from an Islamic fintech perspective. Now, if we take a look at the fact sheet, at the latest fact sheet of Islamic fintech and an overview of Islamic fintech um, globally, uh, there are close to 134 companies. Um, 41 have been funded. The funding received is close to $900 million. And as you can see that most of these companies haven't even reached uh, series A, uh, whereas you have the normal uh, you know, FinTech um, environment where most companies um, have already gone past series A. So the Islamic FinTech space is in its very na nascent stages, but it presents a huge opportunity as more and more companies reach uh, series A level funding. Um, some of the most active investors uh, are seed stage VCs, um, and you have certain incubators, et cetera. Uh, if we look at the exits, um, there's been five IPOs, three acquisitions. Um, and from an acquisition perspective, um, you can see companies like Wired Invest that have already gone through the Series A funding round that have uh, been acquiring other entities. So for example, Wired Invest recently acquired uh, NIA, which is a digital bank in the UK. Uh, or, or, an, or an Islamic digital bank in, in the UK. Uh, some of the top companies include Wildsimple, uh, which is established in Toronto, uh, which has a market cap of $300 million. Um, Rain, which is based in Bahrain, which has a market cap of $18 million. Um, and some of the top cities for Islamic fintech include Hong Kong and Toronto, but that will increasingly change, uh, including, um, including Dubai, uh, Malaysia, etc. So... If you look at the Islamic fintech landscape, you have a lot of um, you have a lot of um, you know innovation coming out of the UK, uh, where there are many fintech platforms. Uh, you also have a lot of in innovation coming out of uh, out of uh, out of Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, etc. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a broad snapshot of the Islamic fintech landscape in terms of different entities that are involved in the space. And as you can see that, um, you know, you have different entities involved in, in different areas, including banking, alternative finance, peer-to-peer uh, -peer finance, uh, challenger banks. Uh, you also have crowdfunding. So perhaps crowdfunding, we have the highest concentration of Islamic fintech companies, perhaps in crowdfunding. Um, 
And then you have companies uh, in, 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 in payments, uh, blockchain, uh, et cetera. Next slide. So we now move over to very quickly to FinTech in Africa. Now, perhaps the greatest opportunity for FinTech in Africa is for Sharia compliance solutions to be created out of existing uh, FinTech platforms. So if you look at the existing platforms um, you know, across Africa uh, per country, and let's take South Africa in, in example. So you have SnapScan, uh, you have Jumo, Hello Pesa, Easy Equities, uh, Lumkani, Sun, Sun Exchange, uh, Mortgage Market, uh, et cetera. And then if you look at countries like Nigeria, you have uh, Shua Remit, Piggyvest, Kobo Coin, uh, et cetera. Um, if you look at Kenya, you have the famous M-Pesa, Kiva, which is a global uh, loans provider. Uh, you have Simba Pay, Abacus, uh, Butsoko, Farm Drive, et cetera. So these are some of the platforms or FinTech platforms currently based in Africa. And perhaps um, a strong example um, of FinTech is the, Ju is the Jumia platform in Nigeria, which uh, a couple of years ago became a unicorn and listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So this proves that uh, there's a huge opportunity for Islamic FinTech in Africa. And as I've mentioned previously, is that 42% of the population in Africa are Muslim, and they definitely require services including Islamic loans, Islamic microfinance, Islamic credit, Islamic wealth and investments, uh, et cetera. And as we see a huge move uh, of, the, of the millennial population um, you know, uh, coming into money, they would e essentially seek these type of services. Uh, next slide. So we now move over to Islamic block blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, so very quickly, I'll, I'll take you through how an Islamic uh, blockchain or smart contract works. So essentially, how does, uh, how does blockchain work? So for example, someone requests a transaction. The requested transaction is broadcast to, to a P2P network. Uh, there is a validation of the transaction um, and a, a verified transaction can invoice a cryptocurrency uh, to one party. And once the transaction is verified, uh, then a new block is added to the blockchain. Um, and that is how a, a transaction is validated against a, against, a, against, a, against a blockchain. Uh, if we look at the intrinsic um, you know, aspects of a cryptocurrency, um, it has no intrinsic value, it has no physical form, and its supply is not determined by a central bank. These are some of the primary uh, you know, features of cryptocurrency. Uh, now, from a Sharia compliance perspective, we cannot issue a blanket ruling on cryptocurrencies, but what we can say is that although it's not a valid medium of exchange, it could be a valid uh, form of value or, 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 a, or a valid uh, asset of value. Now, when we talk of Sharia compliance of an asset of value, essentially what we are referring to is that if the market requires uh, or validates an asset to be having value, then from a Sharia perspective, we will also consider such an asset to be of value as long as obviously it's not something which is impermissible. So an example of this is, let's say for example, there are a hundred trees and we consider those trees uh, to be having value. So imagine if um, you know, a person says, I have 10 cryptocurrencies. If the market considers those cryptocurrencies to be something of value, leave aside the fact that it may or may not be a value medium of exchange. But if the market considers it to be having value, and from a Sharia perspective, we'll say that it is Sharia compliant as long as it does not, uh, you know, provide any impermissible uh, actions, etc. Uh, next slide. So, Islamic wealth tech. So, Islamic wealth tech presents a huge opportunity, or close to thirty trillion dollars uh, that will be transferred uh, to the to the new millennials. Uh, so, if we just take a, some basic statistics, so 86% of, of millennials say that they're very interested in sustainable investing, um, 
approximately 61% of millennials have made a sustainable investment and 75% of millennials think that the investments can influence climate change. So millennials are two times more likely to make sustainable investments than the average investor. Uh, so definitely a huge push by the millennial generation um, as they receive this huge wealth transfer into more sustainable ESG uh, you know, uh, f uh, you know, investments. Uh, and obviously they would seek to do that via technology platforms uh, like WellTech, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So Islamic FinTech in Africa, 50% don't have access to branch networks in Africa. So this is a huge opportunity for any FinTech platform to be, to be created. <clears throat> and especially if we're looking at the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. So the AFCTA, would essentially render uh, the African countries borderless um, and approximately 50% of the African population don't have access uh, to, to branch networks. Um, 42% of the Africa, African population are Muslim. Uh, it is the youngest population globally. Um, <clears throat> can we go to the previous slide? Uh, it is the rise of the middle class in Africa and the top investors uh, of FinTech in Africa are Barclays, uh, the Omidia Network, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the MasterCard uh, Foundation. Uh, so these are some of the top investors uh, in Africa for FinTech. Uh, next slide. Okay, so th these are some of the figures of uh, financial inclusion in, in Africa, as you can see. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the funding of startups in Africa has hit one billion, uh, the $1 billion mark in 2019. So definitely there is funding available uh, for for Islamic uh, Islamic fintechs uh, or fintechs in in Africa. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, this slide basically covers uh, Islamic fintech for agricultural finance and microfinance uh, in in Africa. Um, so we'll go through this very quickly. Uh, according to ENY, the adoption of fintech is not an option anymore, uh, as fintech provides for better risk management, Islamic microfinance, and Islamic microfinance product will be free from Sharia risk, and, and it will have much more efficiency. Uh, microfinance will speed up financial inclusion, and we can create a more efficient financial ecosystem. Uh, can we go to the last slide? Um, a previous slide? Uh, so, how can we assist? Uh, so, we are able uh, to assist from a technical perspective. We also provide global networking for fintech. Uh, we provide funding. Uh, we provide the Islamic compliance for fintech platforms. Uh, and we also identify global partners to develop fintech solutions. Uh, in terms of GIFS's tech in initiatives, we are launching a, a fintech aggregator in South Africa that will provide uh, institutions um, with the ability to uh, provide their solutions to our platform, uh, the uh, Muslim community would be able to access the cheapest and best uh, Islamic uh, services through our platform. Uh, and we will be also launching a Isla an Islamic robo-advisor in, in South Africa. So this robo-advisor would provide you with a uh, global uh, opportunity uh, to invest in stocks, ETFs, etc. Um, so these are some of our initiatives as Global Islamic Financial Services. Um, lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Minara Chamber of Commerce. For, uh, you can contact uh, the Minara Chamber of Commerce at, by email at kzn.minara.org.za. And you may also contact us on our contact details. Um, CEO at gifsrv.com. Uh, and you can also go to our website, www.gifsrv.com. Um, and uh, inshallah, we now terminate this session.
um, of on Islamic fintech, and inshallah, we will bring another session as part of a series on the on Islamic fintech and fintech and the fintech sector. So with that, um, I'd like to terminate the session, and we make dua that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepts our efforts and also accepts all our ibadat and all our acts of worship during this holy month of Ramadan, inshallah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.